Welcome everyone. And just as everyone's aware, we're gonna be recording it as well. So you can, uh, we'll have an open question session at the end, um, but I'm gonna go through the slides in a few minutes once everyone gets in. And then it will also be available for you to review. Are you okay with me starting the recording, Teresa? I am okay with that. Oh, uh, I think you have to do it actually. Okay. Well, because now you're the host. So at the very bottom of your Zoom page, there should be a little circle that says record. Right. That's not it. It's it's recording right now. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Great. For Just a note before we get started, the um, uh, those of you who are participants, there is a chat and a Q and A. Um, it, we've we've found historically that it's easier to use the Q and A because it will be able to put all those questions in one spot, and then I can save those questions for any questions we don't get to during the Q&A session. So you can use the comment section, but it, it will be less effective than the Q&A um, button, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Yeah, and that would be really helpful, Adam, if at the end you can just go through that for me and offer the questions up because sometimes they come up while we're going through the slides. So people can feel free to type those in. Are we just about ready, Adam? Yep, I think we can get started whenever you're ready, Teresa. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Teresa Hitchens Olson. I am the Director of College Access at Great River School. I am uh, running this college night for you. This is specifically made for 11th graders to kind of go through the process and what is going to be happening over the next year. Uh, college for Juniors starts right about now as far as college support. And then we go all the way again till that February, March, and then I switch again to Juniors. So it's kind of like rolling a, a ball up a hill <laughs> and then doing it all over again. So here we are. Uh, Again, my name is Teresa Hitchens Olson. I am a Bush Fellow for the State of Minnesota for Equity in Higher Education. I run my own, own college coaching firm and I serve on the National Board for College Admission Committee and I am a GRS parent. So that's a lot of stuff. But basically what that's saying is I'm incredibly passionate about this college um, experience. I work really hard to reduce debt it is something that I care deeply about. Uh, last year's numbers, I'm also very data-driven. Last year's numbers was $3.2 million for the graduating seniors um, during, during the height of COVID, and COVID is still happening, um, but it was a huge win for us. We are ranked one or two in the country as far as college access and scholarships, and again, I work on that on a national level. So I do both sides. So I try to sit with admissions officers at some of the top colleges in the country and see what they're looking for as far as college admissions and adapt uh, to COVID and all the needs that are happening as it's an ever-changing process. We approach college and career access at Great River in a holistic manner. I believe very strongly that relationships matter. I have been in education for 30 some years, which makes me very old, um, but I have seen that relationships in the way that kids feel connected to people makes a huge difference. And that is one of the strongest things we have in our college program. And I have seen it play out time and time again to be incredibly successful. I offer workshops and panel discussions from experts in the field, and I'm constantly involving this program based on data. I am the one college person uh, with 74 students, and 98 of them are going to a four-year college. So let's talk about a little bit about expectations. What I hope this does is lay out some healthy 
uh, structure and boundaries and open us up to questions and what Great River does and what we don't do and how you can get support in other ways and the resources that your students have. I started this in 2016 as a Bush Fellow and it was started by grants in that area. And we are now, um, I'm in my seventh year of graduating class. So that's, that's really exciting to me to see how it has changed and how we have evolved over the last seven years. So what can your students be doing now? They all received a, received a survey and this sets up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me which happens during school hours, parents are welcome to zoom in, in on that if that is something that the student would like. Uh, if they just want to meet with me by themselves, or you, we can figure out other times to meet as well. But those are happening right now over the next month. This survey basically asks students different questions about how they learn, what kind of environments do they learn best in, um, kind of what they're looking for in college, whether they're even looking at college and where we can start some of those conversations. It helps me know what your students' needs are and also sets you up for potential scholarships and internships as I work with them to develop kind of this holistic college application or college process. Uh, students have three one-on-one -on -one meetings with me and that's something really important to note as a college counselor at Great River, it's very different from coaching. Coach, we'll talk about what a coach is, but that's a separate thing. Um, they have three one-on-one -on -one meetings and then I do large workshop formats where I go through how to write an essay, uh, how to fill out the activities forms, how to do the Common App. And those workshops are generally happening on Wednesdays. Um, there will only be a couple before now in the end of the year for juniors. So that's just important. We're all gonna register for the Common App. We're all gonna look at what the Common App in, entails and we're gonna go through some basic college information. But I am not sitting with all 72 students and an average student is applying for maybe eight to 10 colleges now and doing all those it's just humanly impossible. So that's just important for, for parents to know. Um, it is vital for students to attend all of these workshops and meetings and to read their emails. I run the, that format of the workshop very similar to this where I do a slideshow. Um, if for some reason they're sick, uh, the slideshow is available for them to go through and they can always write me questions or talk to me and pop into my office. What, uh, what else students should be doing is exploring this possibility. So this possibility of college, what does it look like? Doing college tours, web searches, finding out what learning environment works for them. One of the things I talk a lot about with them is listen to your body. So if you feel really excited going into physics, that tells you something. If you're uh, love group discussions or working collaboratively and you just relax, that tells you something. Be open to the possibilities and the yes. Uh, the doors we truly close are the ones that we shut ourselves. And that is, I've, I've seen students who have traditionally not done well in high school at Great River go on to do exceptionally well in college. And so we get to reinvent ourselves, something I strongly believe in. We get to pay attention to what, uh, what we learn and how we learn and to grow that muscle. My goal is not to get every student into the top tier college. My goal is to have a very holistic approach so that students can see what works for them, a place where they can feel happy and a place where they can thrive based on their unique learning style. And that's something I very strongly believe in because we all learn differently. Okay, what can caregivers, parents do now? Acknowledge the changes for students. College is not the same as when we went to school and it has changed dramatically in the time of COVID. I had two GRS graduates as daughters, one in 2012 
and one in 2016. In that four year period of how college changed, it was amazing to me. It wasn't even the same format. So things are constantly changing. And that's part of what I really love about it. Um, it's always a new challenge. Uh, COVID was a huge challenge and online learning was a huge challenge and looking at how we translate that to colleges and how we do that. That was something I was reading tons about and working with students with, and we were incredibly successful as a community in that area. And it will change this next year for your students. So just know that it's, it, it isn't like it was when you went to school and that's okay. Um, it means we're still always learning. 85% of the colleges do not require the ACT and SAT. It is projected that that number will go even higher next year. That is also true of scholarships. So uh, some scholarships did require the ACT. Uh, this year I'm seeing none of, if you write that you are unable to take it or do not take it, they waive that component. Uh, what else is uh, getting excited for the future is a complicated process right now, especially with COVID. We are going from in-person learning to online learning to having February where, where we only have a few days in class with each other. It is going up and down and how do you feel engaged in your classes is changing. How we as teachers engage your students is changing right along with that and how we deal with those real life problems in real life time. What um, you can do as a parent is you will be receiving a survey this week. I ask that you fill that out as well. I am asking questions about what you know about the college process, not in a test way, but is this your first child to go to college? Um, how prepared do you feel? What you know, a lot of stuff. I'm probably the only one who needs to know about income stuff. And that isn't because I want to know how much you make. It's because I want to know um, strategically what schools are going to give you the most money. And you have the choices to answer those questions or not answer those questions. But strategically, it really does help me look at what schools I can um, showcase to your student that they may have not considered that might give them a huge scholarship in that area. Um, you're also going to be looking at your taxes. This book, Re How to Pay Wholesale for College, there are three or four copies in the college office. It is also available free on uh, Kindle. I would say it is written from a very cis white man financial advisor person. And so uh, it isn't very accessible in some ways, but is one of the few books that I have found that really breaks down the money part. And I think that's important. Um, looking at how you file your taxes this year, uh, filing your taxes will be strategic. They will be looking at your junior year taxes. So this coming period, I su suggest if you have time, you might want to look at that Wholesale for College book by Andy Lockwood. Um, if you've already filed, we, you know, it's not a huge thing, but it is helpful. And I always want to add things that are helpful. If you have, we could have a whole discussion on ways that you could um, increase some aid and scholarships, but basically you, you want to be reading books and articles like this on ways you can be very strategic about that financial aid process. The nitty gritty, make college talk part of the conversation without stress. And that's a hard thing to do as a parent. Again, I've had two kids who've done this and we, want, we all want great things for our kids. And that looks different for every kid. And so what is that? How to be supportive without pushing is a balance that we all struggle with as parents, um, also that I struggle with as a college counselor. And so a lot of that is just listening and open, opening up the college conversation. College visits. This is one of the strongest things at Great River. We have over 
68 different colleges from all over the United States and internationally come to our little small charter school. I can't even tell you how unheard of that is in the college community, but we, we make it happen. And that happens from September to October. Um, you can be going on college visits now, doing local visits, even if your, your child says to you, I will never go to school in Minnesota. It's okay to still go visit McAllister and see what you like about it and what you don't like about it. Do you like the number of students there? Does it feel too small or too big? Do you like the fact that it's in an urban place? Those kinds of experiences give me information. So when you sit across from me and tell me what you liked and didn't like about a college visit, it really helps me navigate that college list for you. Um, also, for parents to acknowledge that this is a big change for you as well. Uh, parenting a child in this next season is different than we have ever done before as parents. So just acknowledging that we don't, we don't know what we don't know. And so ask as many questions and know that I'm here to support you as much as possible. What tools does GRS give you for support? Again, we have those workshops on the common application, essay writing. I just finished a big workshop with seniors about scholarships and how that differs from college applications. I have fee waivers for applications for free and reduced lunch status. Also fee waivers for ACT for those students who qualify for free and reduced lunch. Three meetings for families. Uh, basically, again, we go back to that 72 students and one me. So this uh, one year in your junior year in spring, if you would like to have a meeting, I could set that up and then to your senior year, which would be the start of school. And then at the end, as you're figuring out financial offers and trying to, hopefully your, your child has gotten tons of yeses and you're trying to navigate that process of what school fits best in all the things that you all are wanting. Um, other great resources. One of the reasons that we've been so successful in this process is the guys who know you. I have an amazing team. They, they are incredible people who I feel fortunate enough to call my friends as well as people I work with. And I love my job. I tell students all the time to look for people who love their jobs and what they do and pay attention to how they got there. So we have wonderful guides who are there to support. They are there to write reference letters. I am committed to writing uh, a letter of reference for each and every student who attends Great River. And I say that being up to about 86 right now this year. But what that means is that in that letter, I'm looking for the unique things that make your student special. And I'm really showcasing their unique talents. And again, this is something that I researched about equity where a lot of guidance counselors, are, most of them aren't even writing letters. And I've seen this make such a huge difference in not only admission people getting to know our students, but supporting them after they get into college. I also do a rating. What is a rating? It is, it says what curriculum you're doing. So if your student is doing the IB diploma, taking IB classes, they're doing a, what they're calling a rigorous uh, curriculum. Also in the rating, I'm saying, how much is this student showing up for CAS or doing volunteer hours or involved in student leadership? I'm also rating uh, as far as their responsibility or character. And again, I'm trying to serve them well and give accurate reports about that. Their mid-year report is their, just what it sounds like. It's their mid-year grades. Some of them are two, like for quarter grades, and then this mid-year for semester grades, and then a final report. And that is going to, all those are going to every single student, um, Every student, every single college your student applies for. So if you think my job 
is half paperwork, you would be correct, because <laughs> it has a great deal of paperwork in it. That transcript request form, we supply those for students who are applying to colleges not on the Common App, such as most people don't know that a lot of the California schools like Berkeley aren't on the Common App. Georgetown is not on the Common App. So we are supplying transcript requests for them as well. And also a reference request form that goes to teachers. Again, I do those scholarship workshops. Uh, the Common App is, for those of you who may not know what it is, it is like a portal, the main portal for college applications. You can apply to over 800 schools across the United States and then again globally. It gets one application. It is what Great River uses to load up transcripts and all those uh, letters of rec. Great River also has a college planning uh, Facebook page that some of you may not know about, and it's just called Great River College Planning. And what I do there is just post articles that are basically for parents or scholarships, just so you can have update information on how things are changing. What students are using, because students will tell you Facebook is dead, uh, Schoolology tools and updates. Again, I'm putting the scholarships in there. I have a board outside my office that I update monthly because the scholarship game is a huge one. So, uh, I am putting scholarships up there every single month in internship opportunities, and that is right outside my door. Again, that was personalized college visits with over 68 colleges per year. I will be setting them up. Those happen in September and October, and students have them. They happen during school, and only seniors, so you're juniors next year, hard to believe, but true. Uh, only seniors attend those, and that gives them a one-on-one -on -one chance to meet with the people who are going to be reading their applications. And that has made a huge difference. We are at 12, almost 12, I believe. I'm gonna over count myself a full rides this year for uh, the college process. And that is continuing to grow. And that is about these admissions officers feeling very passionate about these great river learners and thinkers. Uh, I also provide graduate contacts, who people who have gone to the school before you, and they love to share info. They also know that they owe me because I help them a lot. And one of the things I will tell your students is we help the people who follow us, and that's incredibly important. So they're there to, um, to talk to you about the real nitty gritty. I also run ELM for seniors, which are the two last weeks of May, and that has college students come in and talk to them about the real life situations in college that freshman year and help them prepare for that. Uh, connections outside of GRS. I have a list of college coaches. For those of you who do not know what a college coach is, that is like a tutor or a personal coach or a trainer. It is someone you pay separately outside of Great River to do that one-on-one -on -one process. It is something that I do during the summer with students from all over, again, the US. Um, and I have coaching clients and I have a list of other people who do, do that same kind of work. Uh, connections, other connections outside of GRS are internships. Um, program connections. So if they're interested in a certain program like engineering, things they can do during the summer, I work hard to connect them to that. And also specific scholarships, depending on who they are as individuals. I try to connect them to that in that one-on-one -on -one meeting and also um, for them to consider all these possibilities that they are there. So let's look at this deadline. This is a fun little thing. So this March and April, which we are in now almost, it is February 28th, um, your students will be getting a email request. Again, they should, they need to start practicing that muscle of checking their email. Also something um, you all might consider is students having a separate email for college. If they are someone who really struggles with seeing a lot of email, um, that might be helpful but you are having a one-on-one -on -one meeting. I'm having a one-on-one -on -one meeting with students 
I'm gonna be open during that spring parent conferences for junior parents um, to talk to me as well. And then that April, May, we're looking at summer possibilities. That's what you should be thinking about. Um, you should be attending the Common App Location Workshop, but the Common App Location itself does not open until the end of August. So that's important. A lot of people push their kids to apply early. That doesn't always work. Again, this is a very strategic thing. So it depends where they're applying. Um, their application might have things like activities where they don't have a lot of things on there. How can they fill some of that up? Or what do they wanna study or begin? How can they showcase that? So those are things you're thinking about that in that April and May. Uh, but I will make sure that every student has an account and they have walked through what an account looks like and what a college application looks like. Some students may also take the ACT or take a practice test to see if that's somewhere, again, you can showcase your skills or talents. Uh, May and June college visits are open and those college visits would be at specific colleges like going down to St. Olaf. Um, do one locally, even if you know you won't go there. So again, that is something to think about, even if you're not going away on, for the summer or traveling. Um, but if you are traveling, look at the colleges around where maybe you're traveling and just do a quick visitor tour um, and look at that space or that location. Also consider in this May and June, who might be your letter of rec? What teacher do I have at GRS who I have a good relationship with? Am I showing up for their classes? Am I turning in my work? Is this someone who can really showcase my strengths uh, both academically and who I am as a person? June and August, GRS is closed. Uh, again, I'm not answering a lot. I try to have a really healthy boundaries about this, but I'm not answering emails during that time and look at that college coaching if your student needs that one-on-one -on -one support and that is separate from school. And again, I have a list of lots and lots of people um, who do that kind of work. And then your senior year big deadlines, October, summer to October. So September, we start with a big fury of workshops and having them the whole month of September. And then some in October, we have all our college visits starting. It is a very, very busy time for us. Uh, the FAFSA opens on October 1st. Again, a lot of people make this big mistake and rush to do the FAFSA. It is something where it's really helpful to do a little bit of research on, read some of the books that I suggested, uh, talk to other parents who have filled out the FAFSA. What do they wish they had done differently? That kind of thing. That opens on October 1st, but it is by no means needed to be completed by that date. You have till, uh, usually for most colleges, January 15th. So you have that big span of a couple months um, to get that work done. November 1st is an early decision deadline what is early decision? It is a legally binding uh, commitment to the college that would be a student's first choice. It should usually be a college that is 100% need. And that means it meets all of the students need um, it, or, and is competitive. So if you look at schools like Carleton, or a school like Stanford, or a school like Middlebury, which are call, which are tier one schools, uh, they're super competitive to get into there. Uh, they are taking, COVID has changed these numbers. So a lot of them are looking up, up to 60% of their incoming classes made in that early decision. There is an early decision too then again for students in January. So if their application isn't ready, some colleges have early decision too as well. November 15th would be another early decision and then an early action. What are early actions? It's not legally binding. It just says, I really would like to go there, but I might like some other school as well. And I will be talking to your student about the differences between these things, but I just wanted you to have the deadlines 
a lot so you don't plan things <laughs> during this time or your student isn't missing school during this time or you're not having a deep heavy like discussions during this time that are separate from college because this is an incredibly stressful period for them so that all the way up till this december kind of january 1st january 15th these are all heavy heavy college times and they need to be um, at school and also to have as stress-free a you know ability to make get these things done as possible again that october 1st casa opens December 1st, priority deadlines for some scholarships. December 15th, priority deadlines for some public universities, including the U of M. A lot of people will look and see, oh, the U of M doesn't, it's not due until like January 15th. Well, that is true, but they're deciding their scholarships. The application has to be in by that priority deadline, which is December 15th. Again, that's what makes this college process really hard to navigate because every school uh, could be a little bit different from the other one. December 30th, deadlines for regular decision. Our school is closed. Again, that's important to note. January 1st, deadlines for regular decision. This, our school is closed. And so what are the supports that you might need as a student? You should be looking at those beforehand. January 15th, deadline for second early decision and regular decision deadlines. So that's kind of the big senior. It all comes at us like a very fast train. Teresa, there's a couple of questions. I wonder if we could answer them that are kind of related to that timeline. Yeah, go ahead. Um, first off, there was a question early on about a student survey. Um, yeah. Is there a deadline for that student survey? Nope. What it does is just cues you up in line to have a meeting with me. So, okay. so kind of as soon as you can. Yeah. Um, next is, is that timeline that you had available as a handout or should people just look at this slideshow to get those dates? It is available as a handout. There's this nifty box right outside my office that has paper forms of things like this, uh, the uh, letter of request form and what to do uh, for your junior year and all those deadlines. But this again will be available on Schoology so they can just flip through it as well. Cool. Uh, next question is, is it less beneficial to do a tour in the summer, given that campuses are empty? That's a great question. Um, less beneficial. It's different. <laughs> so I do think that it's nice to always be on um, campus when students are there, but students tend to always be there. You have things running in the summer where students might be doing their research um, you have activities, you also have, we're going to talk a little bit about summer classes that are available for juniors and seniors to be on campus. So you do get a feel of an environment and culture. Is that different, say, in November or March? A little bit. But I do believe that you can kind of feel it out and they have people set up there to give you tours regardless of. And I would also say, not that I think this will happen or, but if COVID came back in full force, colleges did adapt to that of doing drive-through tours and they were super accessible. St. Olaf was wonderful about that where you could just listen to it like it was a movie. I mean, and it's not the same, but it did give you a feel. Cool. Um, one other question, oh, two other quick questions. Um, are there going to be field trips to college campuses for juniors and seniors or do those happen on our own time? Those happen on your own time. Cool. And then one final question as of right now, um, do, do we offer support with securing accommodations for the ACT? Uh, we do offer support in that. And I've answered several emails about that. So for those of you who may not know what an accommodation is, it is usually for a student who has an IEP or a 504 um, and or is differently abled and can meet those accommodations to make it more equitable for testing. So I can definitely answer that. Cool, those are all the questions for right now, thanks. Okay. So what are the parts of a college application? You have the student info, the common application essay, which is about six, it isn't just about, it's 650 words. And I tell students we're going, um, we're going for that 620 around there. 
I make a commitment to read every single student's comment application essay and to offer them feedback in that. The supplement essays, so no matter what, no matter where they apply to school, I will read that and give them feedback on a, a Google, on, they'll send it to me in a Google Doc. On their supplement essays, some schools have this, some schools don't. It is a little bit like a Pandora's box because again, this has changed so much from when we were in school. Students can be writing small novels <laughs> for certain schools. And you would say, oh, is that because of the harder schools to get into? Not necessarily. Some, some schools will have three or four essays that are 500 uh, words each that we would have never guessed they would have. So that's why it's kind of important to plan ahead and to look at, and again, you know, some of that support. If writing isn't your student's bag or they want, there's lots of different supports for that. Interviews, sometimes I go through how to do an interview, uh, what colleges are looking for in an interview and what typical interview questions are. I have also practiced interview with students. Um, visits both online and in person happened this year. So that were, you could visit virtually as well. Um, and I will show your student how to do a virtual tour of any of the schools they're interested in, because that's a great way to start. This word down here, demonstrated interest. This is a tricky word. So some colleges use demonstrated interest as one of their deciding factors. How do they track that, you ask me? Well, they're tracking, has the student set up an interview if interviews are offered? They can even track, and this is scary, whether the student has opened an email from that school or not. So they're able to track that to see if a student looks interested in that school. Do all schools do this? Of course not, but some do track the demonstrated interest showing up for info sessions and all those things. So that's a great question to ask if you're going on a tour. Um, is, are they tracking that? Financial forms, FAFSA is a form that every student fills out uh, that said, and we have undocumented students at Great River, there's a Minnesota Dream Act, and that is your FAFSA, um, just because of the federal forms and such, and I can help support with that. A CS profile is only for from some colleges, and they are generally colleges that are 100% need schools, and that means they meet 100% need that that student needs to go to college. Custodial waiver can be filed if, say, you, you're in a one-parent household, or if you have divorced parents and one parent isn't financially responsible for you or doesn't support you, then you can file a waiver so that only one parent's income counts. If, and it should be the one who, again, is financially responsible for you. So let's go over that because everybody gets really <laughs> tripped up on this one. So FAFSA is every student, almost every student is filling out the FAFSA. The CSS profile is only for certain schools. And again, I will show your student how to check. Does my college that I'm applying for need the CSS profile? It is a deeper dig into your finances. So what it is asking is, do you have student loans? Do you have, are you caring for an aging parent? Are there other extenuating circumstances that are affecting your income? Um, did you win the lottery and you haven't reported that, that money on your taxes? So again, there's ways to look at this and you want to um, be as complete and honest as possible, but don't rush to report information that's not on your taxes. That is the form that they're going for. On the school forms, this is what I do. So your transcript up to your junior year grades and your first quarter grades I'm reporting and then your mid-year report. And then I'm doing that student eval counselor, your IB classes, if you're doing the diploma, I'm reporting that, um, a counselor letter of rec, and you pick the guides, we're gonna do your letter of rec. And then I turn in a final report. So those are the school forms that are part of that application. Are there any questions about that application process? 
Adam, do you see any? Uh, there was a question about um, what these things stand for, which you just um, kind of said, but there, there was a question about a FASA, F-A-S-A, -S is that a thing? Yeah, so the FASA is a federal, um, it's a federal form for financial aid. Okay. Um, and there was also a question from before, um, kind of relating to um, supporting students with accommodations. There was a follow-up question that I missed, um, asking, "What about students who are not who are not or less are less interested in college? Are there We're supports get to that slide, so. with high anxiety through this process yeah. um, to the point of them giving up or feeling like they never make it?" Don't make yeah, it. we'll we'll get to that. Cool. That that slide. I I guess I can quickly answer that as especially through the last two years that we have lived through in education, there is a lot of anxiety around college and education and learning. And that is why we go back to that holistic uh, approach at Great River and really getting to know the student. And I'm working to try to build a relationship, not just because I have this title, but because I really truly care about your kid. And I wanna help them um, feel that the world has possibility for them and find out what they're passionate about. So that's something that I'm very committed to is getting to know them. And I deal with students who um, have had huge anxiety about this college thing. And also students who have had very low GPAs and not done well at GRS who are flying now in college and just doing incredibly well and then going on to have incredible careers. So. I, I, one, I talk, I also introduce them to other students who have gone before them, who have maybe struggled with the same things. So that's something that I do. Hey, what other supports besides a four-year college? Um, I don't believe that four-year colleges are for everyone. I do think it's important to learn for a lifetime. And obviously I believe in education or I wouldn't have done it for so long. So um, I believe in learning and connecting students to places where they can learn. And for some people that looks like a four-year college. I would also say again, maybe your child has done superb at Great River and this kind of learning environment works incredibly well for them. And so we take that into note when we look at schools, but we also take into note for maybe the kid who it didn't work really well with. Maybe they need things that have more technical or are more structured or bigger environments. Or, so those are things I let kids reinvent themselves. And I think that's incredibly important for us to do as parents as well, that our kids get to be young adults who either did great or didn't do great or all, but they get to be in charge of this next chapter in their life and they get to reinvent who they are as learners and thinkers. So that said, we're looking at sometimes students go to community college, which is different. That usually is a two year or might be a trade school. Um, GRS offers connection to community college visit dates, workshops and internship. The Power of You program, Great River has a wonderful partnership with the Power of You. Um, and I have even spoken there about equitable um, and Equity, equity and ways that we can encourage more students to do this program. It is two years of community college free for people who have incomes under 75,000. It lets them try school no matter what their GPA or is. There's no essays involved. You just apply for it. Um, you can do any major. And again, those are both at the St. Paul and MCTC. And we've had tons of students go through that and really loved it. We also have transition programs. Those programs might have a focus on a student having um, a disability or um, might have uh, specialties on students with autism and things like that. And there's a list of those transition programs available at the college office. Again, we have this wonderful thing built into Great River that we don't always talk about, which is this cast this community action and service that is built in and is a graduation requirement for all students at Great River to try different jobs and programs and activities. And there's a board, I don't know if you've all been up 
and upper adolescence adolescent lately, but there's a giant board that says what your student could try. Could they try being a librarian? Could they try being an electrician? All of these working in a hospital, they get to try these things. And I would say again, that's what separates GRS graduates from other people. They've, they've gotten to try a lot of these things beforehand and see what they like or they don't like. We also have connections to tech and trade programs at Great River. I'm always working to develop that and make that bigger. Um, we also do support with uh, gap years and we feature gap year fairs so students can look at what that looks like. I help students write a gap year plan if they wanted to do a gap year plan, counseling on what to do after your gap year and connections to the Rotary program. For those of you who may not know, that is a federal a program through the United States, which offers high school graduates the ability to live in another country and work with a local nonprofit there and do amazing things. And we've had several Rotary Scholars use that as their gap year. Any other questions? I see a couple in the Support. There's a couple of questions that I think you maybe already answered, but I'll, okay. I'll just say them out loud. Um, what about students who have a very high GPA at Great River, but have burned themselves out academically? Ah, uh, great question. Why? Like looking at that life balance. I mean, I'm, I'm 50 some years old and I'm always looking at that life balance. So if you failed out, feel burnt out academically, look at why is that happening? Is there something tied to perfection? Is there something tied to um, other things going on in your life? I think it's really important to ask yourself that why question. And I hope, I really truly hope that my seniors come out with balance and that's, that's important to me. Thanks, Teresa. Um, kind of similar to this, how do we support students who have zero idea what they wanna do? Are there any resources like th resources or things like personality or aptitude tests? Yeah, we again, we don't do that. We do it very holistically uh, because those personality tests or those little quick quizzes that we all took in high school really didn't give us a lot of questions. And they always came out with weird answers like, you know, if, not that being a funeral director's word, but it always came out with different things that really didn't tell us about why and how we learn. So a lot of the questions that we're asking at GRS is, again, where do you feel most relaxed? Well, how, what do you enjoy? What are you doing in your free time? What class are you most excited about? Those are the kind of questions we're asking. I love the question about what do I want to be? Because I think the trick here is to realize that nobody, if they were really honest, knows exactly what they want to do with their life. And that's kind of something we're sold at an early age that we're supposed to know. But I think that you're really supposed to find joy and things that you're passionate about. And most of the jobs that your student right now will be doing 20 years from now might not even exist yet. So you have 70% of freshmen now who change their major within the first year. And if we stop getting kids stuck with this, what do you wanna be when you grow up? And start focusing on this, how do you learn? How do you find balance? How do you care, become passionate about learning? I think we changed the way our workforce works. And that's something I'm incredibly passionate about and could talk for another 45 minutes about, but well, it's kind of boring. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. I got two more questions, um, maybe maybe three. Um, how do you how does somebody ease their anxiety about choosing which college to go to? Great question. Um, I tell students that their job is to get yeses. So our job is to get yeses right now. As a senior class, a lot of them have no idea. They're still waiting to see what that yes looks like. So maybe that yes looks like you know, a $60,000 scholarship. That's a nice yes. Maybe that looks, yes, looks like uh, an opportunity to study in Chile and travel uh, every year. And that's something the college is willing to pay for. Maybe it looks like that you get to have your dog with you because some campuses let you have your pet with you. So your job is to get as many open doors as possible in this college application process. And then in March, the end of March, beginning of May, 
uh, when you have to make a decision to lay all those yeses out and say, hey, that may not have been what I thought I needed in my junior year, but now in my senior year, I'm seeing that this place is really what I need. And to also know that you could transfer. Um, I would say Great River has a huge thing of most students stay in the school that they pick, but not everybody does. So knowing that if your path that you chose doesn't serve you well, you can always change your path. Um, one more question and then a comment. Well, actually a comment first. Um, it says, students who don't know what they want to do, please tell them about the value of a solid liberal arts education. So um, advocating for someone's advocating for that. Um, I can tell from what you are saying right now that that's what you do. Um, and then also a question, um, do we track retention of students at four-year institutions? Yeah, we do. How does it compare to institution averages or national averages? Yeah, we're high on that. And again, we go back to that holistic and I'm, I'm totally tracking that, especially with COVID happening, right? Because that was really different. Um, what schools were offering in-person in learning and what schools were offering it just, you know, just online. And I think that's an important question to, to ask when you're touring colleges, how did you support your students during the height of COVID? I think that's a great question to ask because students that are good with student support will have a very clear answer for that. Those are all the questions right now. Okay, next slide. Um, now, what do I do? Um, visit a school, make a list of what feels good and what doesn't appeal to you and what does. Pay attention to how you feel in those different learning environments use the college tools at school, talk to current seniors right now. They're super excited to be done and be getting these yeses. Uh, they love sharing that information with you um, and talk to them about what maybe they would have done differently. Would they have waited to the last moment to finish their extended essay or do they wish they had planned ahead a little bit? So asking those kinds of questions. Make a rough plan, look at the deadlines and map out. If you already have two or three schools, you know you wanna apply to, maybe look at when those applications are due. Uh, do a virtual tour, go to an information session. Um, if you're doing the EE, pick a topic that falls in your interest. Pick something that excites you. That's also something I call double dipping because we can put it down in research in the college application process because that is a big part of the IB diploma. You're showing some of those research skills. Uh, work together as a family, not to plan vacations during that deadline. So that's again, those are big stressful days. And when kids aren't here to get that support, uh, that's really hard for them. Attend college panels. We have a, your next panel, because this has been so much fun. You're gonna wanna do it again. And you just will get to talk to other people besides me. So I promise it won't be my voice the whole time. Uh, you'll get to meet with admissions officers that I've worked with. Uh, you will get to meet with alumni and current seniors who have been accepted and accepted their spot in college. And so we're gonna have open discussions about that. That's super useful. And that will be on March 21st, again at 5.30, which I didn't put down and I'll throw that in there and also will be taped, but that's a lovely thing. You can ask questions at that as well. Um, COVID, COVID has changed so many things and we're constantly adapting to that. Um, look at how colleges have responded. What did their student support look like? Also look like, look at student support for mental health for kids. I feel, I feel like that's really important. Uh, student support as far as if you're, you have a BIPOC student or LGBTQ+, what does that look like in the environment? What do those support? How about learning differences? What do those supports look like? What is the community like? How does that feel? How are the students relating to each other? I hope all of you are seeing the difference that a great River community makes and I, I, I hope that's there and I hope that's at other schools as well. I know it's at other schools as well. So look at what colleges are doing. And again, it might look totally different from GRS and that's a good thing for a lot of students for, to, for the reinvention. And also they're growing beyond this high school environment. Um, colleges do their best to understand, but also our job is to explain gaps. So if you have a class where you just got a P because you are out for long-term COVID, 
or you were sick or something was going on in your family, or maybe you usually get A's in all your math classes, but this semester you got a C. It is our job and my job to help you explain that to admissions people and how that affected all of us. And there was actually a place on the application to explain that. Okay, so it's gonna be open question time if I haven't answered all of your questions, but I just go through, we can't know what we don't know. So ask, ask, and keep asking those questions. This is my email at school, um, the support online, college board, common application, virtual visits to college. I put a couple helpful links in here. Flying in programs are available for students who may not have the resources to visit schools. So these are generally for underrepresented students. So low income, first in their family to go to college, uh, diversity, these are all flying programs that you can apply for and they will pay for all of your tickets. We also have partnerships with some schools like Earlham College in Indiana, which every student who's accepted there, uh, they supply a ticket so that you can see what it looks like. And they've been doing that with us for the last four years. Uh, then summer programs at various colleges. The U of M has some wonderful programs. Mac has some wonderful programs. Carlton, Joyce Ivy Scholars. If you are female or non-binary, this is a wonderful scholarship program this summer. And it is open right now um, for Midwest, again, women or non-binary folks, female identifying uh, to apply for this scholarship to go to universities across the country and have a free program that supplies summer learning. Both my daughters did it and it was really super helpful. Uh, Questbridge College Match. For those of you who do not know what Questbridge is, we have had two Questbridge Scholars this year. It is a um, full ride, including books and travel and everything. And again, internships all paid for. It is an income need. Again, we're looking at a $75,000 or less for a family, uh, high GPA for students, but they have a junior a program for juniors right now, which gives college support. And it is called the College Match. And that leads again into that full ride uh, scholarship. And down here is the U of M ED College Summer Camps. All of the I have listed are free. A lot of them are online. They have specific things for engineering, research, all sorts of things. Again, if you are a student, look at that college board. I'm doing my best to really get that working this year. So it's posting all the new things. I just saw today that there were some environmental research opportunities that are paid for you that you could apply for as a junior. So that is all outside my door and is also showing you scholarship opportunities as well. So I'm really done talking uh, and going through the slides now, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have for me for the next five or 10 minutes. Okay, we've got two questions queued up, Teresa. Yep. Um, first off, thinking about uh, how do you think students will feel going from the IB diploma straight into college work? How would you address someone's fears about college just being more academic burnout after everything the diploma has thrown at them? Yeah, um, that is something that we do. We really collect a lot of data at. So once they go away to whatever they do, they're they're fresh. So a lot of most of them going, are going out for your colleges now. So we send them an email. We're looking at how was that transition to um, from Great River to college? If you took the ID diploma, how do you feel that that prepared you? So that's something we're always getting data on and trying to adapt and something I'm also trying to adapt my program with. So how best can I prepare kids to be successful? And that's something that I ask myself a lot. I would say on the average students, especially if they did that IB diploma or took a bulk of IB classes, feel very prepared for college work. Burnout is another whole like workshop I could do. So burnout is, you know, we're all feeling different kinds of burnout right now. We're feeling mass burnout. We're feeling, 
you know, social pressure to go out and then also social pressure to go in. And like, there's so many ways that burnout is happening. And that is something that colleges are really spending a lot of time in ways that they can support students. And that's why I ask you to ask that student support question because some schools are better at it than others. And we're all adapting to a situation that has never existed before. So as educators, we're trying to do that to the best of our ability. Um, so yeah, and again, people love to do what they love to do. I ask myself every day, how can I keep bringing the passion that I had in 2016 to 2022, right? So that's something I don't wanna have burnout when I work with kids. And I think if we, we focus ourselves on things that we care about and look at the bigger picture and really practice self-care, um, those things all go hand in hand. Thanks, Teresa. Um, another question about uh, school visits and what that actually looks like. Should yeah. people call ahead and make appointments? Should they just show up and walk around the campuses? What would you say? Um, all right, so I'm gonna take that as being two different things. So if you're trying to plan a school visit to St. Olaf, you would look up college visit to St. Olaf and it will tell you that they're open for juniors these days and these days and this is how you can do an appointment. The same for McAllister and Carleton and all those other schools. Um, so you basically Google is your best friend. You're looking at the college site and it's telling you how to book them and there should be a way to do that online. And so you book your spot. If you are going, say you, you go to Maine and you're on a family vacation and you're like, ah, I wish we had made a visit at Colby, which is a school in Maine where we've had great urban students go. It is still okay to stop by campus and just walk around and stop at the admissions office and say, you know, we didn't, you know, we, we're just randomly here and we would like to look around. Most of them will give you a pamphlet that does your own self-guided tour, but it counts. Right, so they record your name and your email and that's that demonstrated interest again. Is it the same as an organized tour? Of course it's not, but it's different. And sometimes it has wonderful surprises like you're able to talk to professors you wouldn't talk to because they're just hanging out in this office that you just walked by and they said hi. And so that tells you a lot about the campus as well. Great River College visits happen again, September, October. They are posted outside my office students are able to see them. If students are applying to that school, like a school like Oberlin or Stanford when they come or NYU when they come, yes, they should come to that college visit and they will see those times. And I try to get those out as early as possible, um, but it is constantly moving and I'm updating that list outside my office. As you know, Adam, almost daily as colleges add and take away. So. Great. Um, someone is noticing that the Joyce Ivy scholarship applications are due tomorrow. Yeah. What should they do if they're interested and in only having heard about it tonight? Well, um, mark it down. Um, it is, I am still writing letters of reference. It is something that has gone out to your kids way before today, but I wanted to get that information out. And so I did send it out to all um, sophomore and juniors I believe two or three weeks ago, and it's also been outside my board. If, yeah, I'm, I'm still willing to write references for it if you were just doing it tomorrow, so, and supplying transcripts. Um, also kind of in that vein, um, someone is wondering if as a junior, uh, should they start applying for scholarships now during summer or wait until senior year? Great question. Um, you should start making us looking at the scholarships that are up on that list and making a scholarship plan. Scholarships are happening constantly. So there are some that are happening in your junior year and some are not. Uh, so that question is yes and yes. You can be looking, if you see something that interests you, mark that date. A lot of parents have scholarships as part of their work. Uh, some of us belong to teachers unions, there's scholarships connected to that. Some of us use credit unions or banks and you'll see scholarships being advertised all the time. And if it's not even close to that date, make, make a note in your calendar. I have a lot of students that just have a scholarship cal calendar. 85% of scholarships go 
unapplied for. So that's a lot of money sitting at the table. I am also planning on doing a scholarship workshop just for juniors in the next month at Great River on a Wednesday, like I just did for seniors, but it will be focused on how juniors look for scholarships. So that will be new this year. Cool. We've got one more question and then we should wrap up because it is past 630. Okay. Um, the question is, what does a college visit include with an organized tour? What does that look like? Oh, great question. So it's usually a student who is attending that school now um, and they are giving you a tour of the campus, um, the student common areas, and the different departments. You on some tours will be able to even see the dorm rooms and stuff. Some of them cut that out because of COVID and then some of them have model rooms, but usually all the aspects of that and they'll answer various questions at the end, but it's usually a student. So that is important to note because that varies, as you know, at Great River, different students giving different tours can vary on who you get, um, but they are all people who have volunteered or it's part of their work study job to give tours. So they generally really love the school that they've attended. Great, that's all the questions for right now. If you have further questions, you can go ahead and email Teresa or you can email them to me and I can connect them back to Teresa. Um, any final words, Teresa? Um, I don't think so. I think I'm good. Thank you all for coming and for making time for me tonight. I really appreciate that. And I look forward to working with you a lot over the next year. So thanks for making time on a Monday night. Thank you. Bye.